Good morning. Welcome to peace. Welcome to your Lord's house this morning. Uh, happy Fourth of July. Uh, give thanks to God today for another birthday of our country in a land where we get to do this. We get to gather in freedom and uh, hear about and celebrate the freedom of the gospel as well. So thank you, Lord, for that. Um, as we gather today, um, we're, we're not going to focus on the 4th of July in church per se. We'll have a prayer about that. Um, but we're going to start a new sermon series. We're going to go through the book of Ephesians. And the idea as we go through the book of Ephesians, there are many themes, but one of the themes that really comes out uh, throughout the book of Ephesians is our identity. Um, we, identity is a, a big deal, right? From, from little on, like, who am I? Where do I fit in? Where do I find value and belonging and significance? And as you go through the book of Ephesians, we're going to see that we find that in Christ. So the idea today and for the next few weeks here is to dig into Ephesians and um, discover who we are in Christ. Today, we're going to see that in Christ we are chosen. We are chosen. Let's begin our worship. Uh, our worship today, everything's on in the, the service folder. Also, uh, with our new screen, we're going to try this. Everything will also be on the screen if you'd like to follow along on the screen, if I can keep up with clicking. Uh, so uh, you can kind of have your head up while you worship too, if you'd like. But uh, both of those are options for you. Let's begin with our first song, uh, Father, We Praise You. I invite you to stand. God invites us to come into his presence and to worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this, I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins. And trusting in Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
Let's join our hearts in prayer. Merciful God, in Christ, you have blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Keep us mindful of your goodness that with thankful hearts we may sing your praise who alone is worthy of honor and glory together with your Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. So for this new series, when I say we're going to go through the book of Ephesians, we really are. So all the readings throughout these weeks are going to be readings through Ephesians. We're going to take a chapter each week. And so I've split it up into two here today. Um, So we're going to take a look at Ephesians chapter 1 today. And in the first half of this reading, this will be more uh, a part of the, the sermon, the message today. But what I want you to listen for is what Paul is so thankful for when it comes to God's people. Um, It's not necessarily because of who they are, but who God has made them and what God has done for them. And so I want you to, to picture yourself being th- or have someone having someone thank God for you because of all these things, who you are in Christ. But we'll talk about more more about this in our message today. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one that he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his pleasure which he purposed in Christ to be, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth and under Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. This is the word of our God. I'd like to continue now with a a children's message. And uh, certainly welcome to come up here if you'd like. Otherwise, uh, right there is fine too. Sometimes when you stay in the pew, people get confused that I'm, the adults get confused that I'm looking at, at them with, with the children's sermon. Like, why is he addressing me? But we're all God's children, right? Good morning. Come on up. Thank you for coming up. Uh, how are you today? Doing good? Thanks for being here. Do you ever like to go to the store and look in the toy aisle? Do you like to look where the toys are in the store? I'll show you a picture. Like, do you ever go to the store and and see all these toys and you get in your head, oh, man, I want one of those toys. You ever do that? I used to do that all the time. I still go into stores and and have those, those thoughts. So let's say that you had some dollars in your hand, okay? And mom and dad said, you can buy a toy. How would you pick out which toy you wanted? How would you pick it out? Would you pick out the one that looks small and kind of 
yucky, would you pick that one? Or would you pick like the biggest one you can get and the shiniest and, and the, the best one? Would you, would you pick that toy? That, would you pick the big one? Yeah, when we pick toys, we pick them because they, they look really cool to us, right? And so that's when I'm talking about choosing, when I'm talking about picking, that's what we usually think of, right? We pick the best. You wouldn't go to a toy store with money in your hand and pick that car, would you? Would you choose this toy? Would you like a car like that? Yeah, that's probably fun. I knew that was going to happen. <laughs> I knew that was going to happen. That's probably the best one of all those, right? Yeah. But when we choose, we usually look at how it looks and say, I want the best one, right? Today, see if I can get this in children's language here. Today, we're talking about God doing some choosing. And God isn't choosing a toy. He's choosing people. Wow. That's, that's different, isn't it? How would God look and choose people? Well, in our brains, we would think he would choose the best, right? The best looking, the smartest, the, the coolest, right? But the problem is when God looks at any of us, when he looks at me, when he looks at us, because of our sins, we kind of look like this old, broken-down car. And so we would think, there's no way God would choose us. But God promises, I chose you. How did God choose us? That's where the cross comes in. When God looks at you, he sees the cross of Jesus that took all of the old rust and broken down parts away, took all of our sins away so that we are like those brand new toys. We're shiny, we're clean, we're perfect, all because of Jesus. So when you hear about God choosing today, here's what I want you to know. God chooses you because he loves you because of Jesus. You are so valuable. You are so perfect to him because of Jesus. God chose you. So let's give thanks for that today. Amen. Thanks for coming up. I appreciate you being up here. Thank you. Yeah, being chosen in, in God, what an awesome concept, but a difficult concept. We're going to talk more about that in our, in our message today. We're going to take a look now at the second half of Ephesians chapter 1. And we're going to see, this is kind of the so what of the first half. So because God did all these things for the Ephesians, look at the, look at the result in the Ephesians. And then we can apply that to ourselves as well. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. This is the word of our God. So we'll continue with our next song. It's a, it's a new song, and so the first two verses will be introduced by a soloist. Uh, I, I believe that this song really captures what we're going to be talking about today in our message about God knowing us in Christ and what that means for us. So all these verses kind of share the whole story.
Jesus. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. All right, I got to grab something here to start out. I was going to put it on, but... So there was a time when this baby was my pride and joy, right? The old high school letter jacket. I should cover up the year, right? <laughs> Any of you have the letter jacket when you're in high school? Some of you maybe have it now. Um, yeah, this was my pride and joy because... This was everything that was important to me when I was in high school. This is everything that I wanted people to know about me. Um, this was um, more than a, a jacket. This, is, this became my identity, right? Because, of course, I had my name on it. Teal was my name, and I went to Michigan Lutheran Seminary. We were the Cardinals. And uh, what I really wanted people to know is I, I loved sports. And... Um, I just wanted people to keep knowing about that, and so I'd try really hard to get all these awards, and I still got a whole bag that I, I thought I'd put on someday, but, but I'm not going to ever. And so this consumed me, right? This was everything that I wanted people to know about me. This became my identity. Do you see any problem with that? You could talk about pride. You could talk about arrogance and that, but I think it's, it's bigger than that. If, th if this was my identity then there's a problem now. As uh, a bald 40-something who hasn't played sports in a while, or been on a team in a while anyway, and hasn't, hasn't won any medals, that, that would mean that I would no longer have any identity. If this is what made me something, then that must mean now that I'm nothing. Right? Now, my point with embarrassingly bringing out my old letter jacket is that I think we all have something like that, right? When it comes to our identity, we have something that we point to, something that we think of, something that we want people to grab onto and say, yes, this is me. Our identity answers those, those questions of who I am. And I don't think it's an arrogance thing. I don't think it's a pride thing always. It's actually a very deep human need that we all have. Like God created us to have this to have this longing for significance, longing for value, longing to be noticed, longing to belong. God put that in us. And so, of course, we gravitate toward different things. This is who I am. This is where I belong. That's probably why there are so many challenges and so much discussion about identity now. Because it doesn't matter what age you are, doesn't matter what station of life you're in, we all struggle with this whole identity, finding significance, finding value, being noticed, belonging. And if we grab onto other things, all of our lives, things change. And so we can always go up and down about who we are. Do we really have value? Do we really have significance? That's really going to be the point of the whole series, but especially today as we get, dig into Ephesians chapter 1. We want to dig in and see that if God made us with these needs, you can guarantee he has a lot to say about it. So we're going to dig into Ephesians and discover who we really are, who we really are in Christ. So again, all of Ephesians 1 is, is fair game for the message today, but I'm going to really focus in on these verses. So I'll read them again. God chose us in Christ before the creation of the world. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. In Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Now, the word that pops out to me right away, you can probably already guess it because I've said it so much today, is the, that word chose. God chose us. And like I hinted at with the children's devotion, when we think of choosing, we, we have this way of choosing 
for ourselves. We choose the best, the brightest, the most attention-grabbing things, right? And so when we hear these words, God chose us, that's the sphere in which we think about that word. Well, there must be something about me that made God choose me. And I almost think that it had to be that way for the very first people hearing these words. These words in Ephesians were written to people who lived in a city called Ephesus. That's where the word comes from. And you can see on a map where Ephesus was. Modern-day Turkey. But it's right on the sea, and it's a very important part of the sea where all the trade went through. And so because it was this, this trade city, it became one of the top four cities in the whole ancient world. It's a beautiful place. It's a place of culture. Like, people wanted to live there. In fact, not only was it a place like New York or L.A., Hong Kong, Tokyo, it, it had one of the one, seven wonders of the ancient world, the Temple of Diana. So people would even go here as like vacation to, to see the great architecture. And so when the people in Ephesus heard God chose you, one of the things they could have thought is, well, well of course. They wouldn't choose the uh, backwater town people. They, they would choose us, Right? But it wasn't just their physical location, it was spiritually as well. Spiritually speaking, they were kind of a special congregation. They were established by the Apostle Paul, and the Apostle Paul had this way of doing mission work. He would usually go into a town, uh, get a group of believers established, get them going, and then move on and start another church. But in Ephesus, Paul stayed for three years. This was the longest place that he ever stayed at for his mission work. And so these people... They, they kind of knew that they were his special congregation. And in fact, we heard it said in the verses, Paul said, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you. Paul loved these people. And their faith was getting a reputation all over the world. So again, when they heard God chose me, they might think, of course he did. I think... People at Peace Lutheran in, in Boulder could maybe have those same kind of thoughts. Uh, I'm not just blowing smoke here. This is like the coolest place I've ever been. I, I've only been here eight months, and I love it here. Absolutely love it. And in fact, it's not just me. I'm not crazy. Every year, it's in the top three places to live in the whole United States. So when we hear God chose us, we could say, well, yeah, of course Boulder, not well, you fill in a town. <laughs> and it's not just the place either. I fall in love with, with you, the congregation. This is a cool place to be. I, I can't imagine people not wanting to be part of this faith family. Not only do we have a good vibe of, of, of family, but uh, the conversations I've had and digging into God's word, worship, it's great. And so when we hear God chose us, we can think, well, of course he did. You see what I mean? When we hear that word God chose, we can easily think that it's the way that we choose things, that it's all about the object being chosen. That's what we first think of. But I want you to think that through all the way. We are talking about some pretty big things today. And I'm not just talking about like big theological, churchy sounding words. Yes, those are there. I'm talking about big concepts, things that affect your forever, your eternity. Chose, adopted, redeemed, forgiven, things that affect your eternity. So if we're talking about those kinds of things, this is an honest question for you. Do you want those kinds of things to be based on you? I know that I am talking to good people, salt of the earth, awesome people. And that's how we all want to be perceived, right? It's almost like our social media image. Like this is the best version of us. That's what we want people to see. And that's okay because that's what we think of maybe at first when we say that God chose us. But what about the you behind the closed doors, right? Um, the, the you that... You, you kind of want to forget sometimes that, that you hope other people don't see and especially you hope God doesn't know about. Like the thoughts, 
that go around in your head that hold on to hate and anger towards someone or the lustful thoughts that linger. You certainly hope God isn't knowing about those when he's doing his choosing. And what about the words that come out of our mouths? Yeah, the little slip-ups. Yeah, the intentional vulgarities. Yes, the words that we use to cut and injure people. We certainly hope God isn't listening when he's doing our choosing. And what about the things that we do? Those things behind closed doors, the things that we do out in public so that everybody does notice us. We hope God's not watching when he does his choosing. You see where I'm going with that? Do we really want a big thing like being chosen being adopted, being forgiven to be about us? Do you want it to be based on us? Because if it is, I have a feeling that this reading would look a whole lot different. And I know that our eternity would look a whole lot different if it was based on me, if it was based on you. But it's not. <laughs> That's the awesome part about these verses. That's the whole point. It's, it's not about you. God chose, God adopted, God redeemed, God forgives, not because of how awesome Ephesus was, not because of how awesome peace in Boulder is. Not about us at all. What is it about? Well, there's another word that is used repetitively through here. Every time God says he does something, this word pops up. Do you see what it is? In Christ. In Christ. Christ is the reason, the only reason God did all of these things. Why is that? It's because that's the reason Jesus came into this world. To literally be you. To be your substitute. So that when God looks at you, he would see exactly what he wants to see to choose. So Jesus had to come into this world and, and he lived without any hateful or lustful thoughts. Without any, using any words to injure people. Without doing anything that was about himself, but only gave his heavenly father pleasure. The perfect choice, that was Jesus, and he was doing it as you. So when God sees you, he sees perfection, he sees Jesus. And all those sins that we just talked about, those sins that would exclude you from being chosen, well, the Bible says the soul that sins is the soul that dies. So Jesus paid that price. He died on the cross. That's what the whole cross is about. God was punishing every sin, and because it's punished, it's gone. It's paid for. And of course, we know God accepted that payment because he raised his son from the dead all because of Christ you have these things. In Christ you were chosen. In Christ you were adopted. In Christ you were redeemed. In Christ you are forgiven. That, that's probably big enough to know exactly why you were chosen, but if you're like me, there's this little part in your brain that says, but still, I mean, come on. A little bit me, Right? There's a couple other cool things in here that remind us of just God, how big God's grace is. Is this, this is unfathomable. When did all this happen? Before the creation of the world. Before you had an opportunity to be born and be all cute and cuddly. Before you had an opportunity to even come to church and to give an offering and to be awesome people. Before all of that, God chose you in Christ. And why did he do that? Why would God choose you? Well, there's another cool phrase here, in accordance with his pleasure and will. Because it made God happy. You know, we, we talked uh, probably a couple months ago about, I mean, use this illustration about uh, paintings of Jesus and how they're so serious all the time. Like the paintings of God in creation or uh, calling Isaiah, those are all serious pictures. If you were an artist and, and painting a picture of God in this verse, it would be a happy face. It would be smiling. It would be laughing. God is enjoying himself. Why? What, what gives God pleasure? What makes him happy? Loving you. 
That's the joy of God, is to love you and to do all of these things for you in Christ. Wow. So it's not about the one being chosen. It's all about the one choosing by grace. Just going to check back on that whole identity thing. What does that do to feeling significant and feeling valued? It ought to boost that pretty well, right? Because you are significant, you are valued, you are loved because of what God has done for you in Christ. Now, how do you know this is all true of you? We've, we've kind of talked about this really theologically, right? How do you know this is true of you? Look at how this talks about these things. It talks about them as a done deal. It's a fact. So here's how you can know. If you've ever been to a font like this and had water poured over your head in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, then guess what? These are true of you. It's a done deal. You are in Christ. If you can open up your Bible, if you can listen to God's promises or read God's promises that say he loved the world so much and you know that the world can be substituted with your very own name, these are true of you. You are in Christ. As you come up to receive the Lord's Supper today and, and you know that that is the very price he paid for your salvation, his very body, his very blood, then these are true of you. You are in Christ. So what does this mean for after church, later today, throughout your week? What does it mean when you're grappling with identity things? And I'll take you back just like to my, to my letter jacket. At one point in my life, it was my letter jacket. That's what I pointed to. What, what is your thing? You meet somebody new or somebody's introducing you and they introduce you as this is who you are. What, what's that thing that you point to? What's that thing that you look at? Who are you? We all have things, right? Maybe it's your job. I'm, and then you say your job. Maybe it's, it's the health, I'm, I'm really healthy. Uh, or maybe it's the, the kind of workouts you do, right? I'm, I'm this. Or maybe uh, you always did well in school, I'm the smart one. Maybe you uh, love sports and so you're the athlete. What, what is the thing? Maybe it's something you have. What's the thing you point to when somebody says, who are you? We all have it. That's fine. We all have this need for significance and value and belonging. Those are all blessings of God. But you know how life changes. What do you do when those things are gone? Who are you? I want to share a story of uh, uh, people that I know a little bit. I met him at a youth rally a couple years ago. Uh, his name is Steve Schrader. He's the, the man there in the army fatigues. You talk about a cool identity. This guy has a cool identity. He is a a Black Hawk pilot in the Army, so he's flying helicopters. That's really cool to me. Um, he's working his way up in the ranks, and because of that, he's got his, he had his eye on retirement, uh, savings set aside. He had these dreams. He's going to be an airline pilot after he retires. Beautiful family. Uh, just if, if, if you wanted an identity where somebody could point to, th this would be a cool identity. However, uh, the reason he was at the youth rally is because of four seconds in his life. In four seconds, everything changed. He was doing a routine uh, training exercise, I believe at the base in Kentucky, and uh, a bunch of things went wrong in the cockpit and crashed. Big flames, he's laying all in the middle of it, paralyzed from neck down, totally out. In those four seconds, he's no longer a Black Hawk pilot. No longer working his way up in the army. No longer were those dreams available to him of being an airline pilot. His relationship with his family would change. Everything changed. So if he was hanging his hat on all those other cool things, who is he then? If those things were his identity, then obviously he was nobody then. But that's why he was at the youth rally. This is him in the wheelchair, and that's his wife next to him. And he shared this, that... In that moment, he realized the one thing that never changes, the one thing that truly is his identity, God's love for him in Christ. When he was able to hold on to who he was in Christ, it didn't matter what changed in his life, that is who he was. That is how he found value. That is where he found belonging, in Christ. 
we don't have to be helicopter pilots to have all of our plans and dreams and good things in life come crashing down. Just like that, we could get some bad news. Maybe our grades tank. We have a horrible ACT score. We get dumped. We lose our job. You name it. Stock market crashes. All those things that we hold on to can be gone in four seconds or less. So who are you? In Christ, you are everything. Nothing changes. You have value. You have significance. You belong in Christ. One last illustration to drive it home. I don't have one with me, but let's say I had a $100 bill. I was giving it away. Who would want it? Okay, yeah, my girls, of course, so the first ones to raise their hand. You're the honest ones. I think everybody would want a $100 bill if it's free, right? What if I took that $100 bill and I just crumpled it up? Would you still want it? Yep. What if I took up that crumpled bill and I threw it on the floor and I started jumping up and down and stomping on it? Would you still want it? What if I took that crumpled up bill, that stomped, hundred, squished $100 bill and shoved it under water for 30 seconds? Would you want it? Why? It's crushed. It's wrinkled. It's underwater, drowned. Why, why would you want it? Because it still has its value. Its value isn't in that piece of paper. Its value, supposedly, <laughs> is in the fact that it's backed by the United States Treasury. Something outside of itself gives it its value. That's what I want you to see today about you and your relationship with God. There are times in your life where you may feel wrinkled and crumbled. You may feel stomped on by everybody else. You may feel like you're underwater. You never lose your value because you are in Christ. In Christ, you are chosen. You are adopted into his family. You are redeemed and you are forgiven. That is who you are. And that's who you'll always be in Christ. Amen. May that peace of God that passes all of our understanding guard to keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. As we learn about who we are in Christ, our hearts just well up with thanks. One of the ways that we give thanks is through our offerings. Um, there are plates in the back. If you have brought a physical offering today, you can also see a QR code and links for online opportunities to give. Uh, we give thanks to you, and we give praise to God for the support of his ministry to, to be able to share this message freely uh, with each other and with our community. To him be praised forever. I invite you to stand as we bring our prayers to God, and today we'll have a special prayer um, for thanking God for the blessings that we have in our country. Heavenly Father, thank you for this privilege of being in your house today, to be in your word, and to come right before your presence to be able to bring our prayers and petitions to you. We know that it is only through Christ that we have this privilege and this opportunity. Lord, we confess that, that so often we grab on to so many of the blessings around us in our life as our identity. And we, we believe that that's who we are and that's where we find significance and value. And yet so often... Those things change, and they're gone in the blink of an eye, and we're left searching for our identity. We give you praise and thanks for Jesus, that because he lived the perfect life for us and that he paid for all of our sins, in him we find our true identity, identity as your adopted children, your forgiven and redeemed people. Give us uh, strength and, and wisdom to be able to to live that identity every single day. When, when things are, are down in our lives, help us to, to hold on to you and to that value and significance and the belonging that we have in your family. And help us to also live that identity out in our community so that many more may know what it's like to have true belonging 
in Christ. Lord, what a privilege to be able to have that opportunity to live for Christ in our community. That comes because of the, the country that we live in where we have these religious freedoms. For our religious freedoms, for our prosperity, for all the blessings that we enjoy as citizens of America, we give you thanks and praise, Lord. We ask that you would give wisdom and guidance and strength to all federal, state, and local leaders so that they can continue to give uh, protection and freedom to, uh, to our country so that we can continue to spread the gospel, be with all those who are serving our country, especially in the military, uh, keep them safe and, and give them justice as they carry out their, their jobs to maintain this freedom. But most of all, Lord, we thank you for the freedom that we have in Christ. We pray all these things in his name and we join in the prayer he taught us. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We continue now with uh, the Lord's Supper. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is good and right to give thanks. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord. Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who has called us to be his own, so that we may live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, we'll uh, come forward for the Lord's Supper. And if you'd like some uh, help preparing your heart for the Lord's Supper, there are some questions on pages eight and nine or nine and ten that help uh, guide you with that. Uh, today, we'll come up in the middle aisle to receive uh, the bread and wine, body and blood, and then go back to your seats uh, through the side aisles. And at the end of 
uh, each row, there are, there's a waste basket so you can throw away your, your cup. So we'll come up the front and back to the seats in the back.
You've just received the true body and blood of your Savior, Jesus. May it strengthen you to live in your faith from now to eternal life. Amen. I invite you to stand for prayer. We give you thanks, O Lord, for the foretaste of the heavenly banquet that you have given us to eat and to drink in this sacrament. Through this gift of faith, you have fed our faith, you have nourished our hope, and strengthened our love. By your Spirit, help us to live as your holy people until that day when you will receive us as your guests at the wedding supper of the Lamb, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated for our closing hymn. Again, words reminding us of uh, God's choice in Christ, giving us our significance and value. Good morning. Again, welcome, and uh, just so glad we could be here to gather in, in God's name today. Uh, I pray that that, that message of, of uh, God's love for you in Christ just really, really does give you that, that true identity that you will have forever, that significance, that value, that belonging. May that comfort you and strengthen you this whole week and always. Um, a couple of announcements. Uh, the first one would be, normally we've had a, a Wednesday evening Bible class uh, by Zoom. Uh, because of different busy schedules between Pastor Spiegelberg in Carbon Valley and, and myself, we're going to take a, a break for the month of July, so there's no Wednesday Zoom Bible classes throughout July. Um, the second announcement would be that uh, we, we have a, a hike planned for the, I think it's 17th? Yeah, the 17th at Heart Lake. If you're interested in that, there's a sign-up sheet on the door as you, as you go. And it sounds like we're going, and the other announcement would be, it sounds like uh, next Saturday, this coming Saturday, we will field a, a softball team for, for peace. So that'll take place in Firestone. So you're still welcome to join us if you, you want to. <laughs> and uh, uh, also, um, you can come and watch too. So I, I can... It's, it's a, I'm not sure what field it's at, but it's in Firestone. I can give you the details if you really want to come out and cheer peace on in the softball tournament. So, uh, Yeah, I should wear my letter jacket. Yeah, weigh me down a little bit. So, <laughs> um, Any other announcements? All right. Well, thanks again, and uh, God go with you. Have a great uh, 4th of July and uh, a great week in the Lord.
Stray, a stricter watch to keep. 